If you have a, a Bible, open it, if you can, to the Gospel of, of Mark, where we're teaching verse by verse through this book. And the, the very first words of Jesus here in the book of Mark create the theme and the context for the whole book. And it's found there in verse 15 of chapter 1, where Jesus says this, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This statement by Jesus, which is the very first words he speaks in this gospel, kind of sets, if you will, the whole context for the gospel. And one of our characteristics as a church is to teach verse by verse through the books of the Bible, and, and to help each of us know them in context and, and why they're written and the theme. And, and so this is right off the bat, the beginning, the purpose, that the time is now, the kingdom of God has come, and Jesus is calling us to repent and believe in the good news of the gospel. So Lord, as we open your word again today, May you have the freedom to speak to us, and may we have the wisdom, uh, be it ever so small, to respond to you and to hear your voice and to allow you, Lord, to continue to fashion and shape our lives by this amazing thing called the Word of God that's been inspired by the Holy Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So grab a seat if you would. Jesus says these words in chapter 1, and then he calls his disciples. He begins to draw them into himself around the Sea of Galilee. He makes his way into Capernaum, that small little town there along the coastline. And as you know, the, the story begins. He steps into the synagogue there on a the Sabbath, and he speaks. And the people are amazed. They go, wow, this, this guy... He speaks with authority. He, he's not like the other scribes or, or, or the other teachers. He, he, he's got his own authority. He doesn't take it from someone else or from this rabbi, but he speaks like no one we've ever heard. And on that day, surprisingly, as he's speaking, there's a man in the synagogue there in the very first chapter who's demon-possessed. And Jesus casts the demon out of him. And then after that, he goes to Simon's house and heals her mother-in-law. And as the sun's going down on that day one, as the Sabbath is ending, it's, it, it's crazy. It tells us that he healed many who were sick with various diseases. The whole city was gathered together at the door, and he cast out demons and he did not even allow the demons to speak. So the, the Gospel of Mark starts off with this, this very strong kind of proclamation that the kingdom of God is here. And then it begins to demonstrate itself through the one who brought it, and that's Jesus, through teaching, through casting out demons, through, through healing. And, and, and you go all the way down to, to verse 40, and it still doesn't stop. A leper comes to him. Uh, Jesus heals the leper. Chapter 1. I mean, it just starts off like fast paced with Jesus just very involved immediately in ministry. Next, he heals a paralytic and tells him his sins are forgiven. He calls a tax collector to come be one of his disciples, and the people are going, What? A tax collector? Are you kidding me? You mean you're going to travel with, a, with a, a known sinner? And Jesus begins to gather these men to himself. He, he, he steps into the synagogue once again. There's a man there with a withered hand. And they're testing Jesus to see if he'll break the Sabbath law in their mind of healing. And he does. And multitudes begin to follow and gather around Jesus. In chapter 3, he begins to teach in parables. His teaches, teaching ministry begins to emerge in a way they've never heard anyone quite teach before. And he 
decides to take his men aside and they're, they're heading across the Sea of Galilee. You remember the story, this giant storm erupts. Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat and he calms the storm. And, and the men in the boat with him are, are amazed. They're, they're like, what manner of man is, is with us in this boat? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And he, and he crosses to the area of Gadara. And, and there, there's this man with a legion of demons. And Jesus delivers him. And, and he's sent back to his own hometown to share all the wonderful things that God has done for him. And he's actually the first missionary in the Bible, a man who had a legion of demons. Last week, we saw a woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, immediately healed when she touches his robe. And then Jesus raises a girl from the dead whose father was a leader of the synagogue, Jairus. And that's just the first five chapters. And listen, here's the theme. The kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus is demonstrating it in no questions asked. He's just there going for it. And the fame and the ministry of Jesus at this point, well, it's off the charts. Multitudes are gathering wherever he goes. So, so we, we pick up our story in, in chapter 6 today. And it tells us, then he went out from there, leaving the, the area of, of the Galilee and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. His own country. Yeah, he, he goes back to his hometown. Ba back to, not where he was born in Bethlehem, but back to Nazareth. And according to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus had been there about a year ago. You probably remember the story. He, he spoke in the synagogue, and they wanted to throw him off the precipice there in that small city of Nazareth. He read the scripture of Isaiah, and, and he was chased out of town, and now he's back. He's, he's back in, in Nazareth here in chapter 6, and it says he went out there and, and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him, and when the Sabbath had come, well, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such a mighty works are performed by his hands? And then there's the question. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. And Jesus said a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, his own home among his own relatives, in his own house. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And Jesus marveled. He marveled because of their unbelief. And so he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. Jesus is back home. I'm sure Jesus must have had some hesitancy, some anticipation as well of going home. I mean, he had spent 28, 29, almost 30 years in the town of Nazareth. That was his home. He knew everybody. That's where his brothers and sisters were, his mother. And there's, there's that theme, you know, that runs through, I think, every human heart, uh, uh, home, going home. Dorothy on The Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. I mean, it's a huge theme in life. Home is the place to, to be ourselves, to, to be welcomed, uh, to belong. You know, I, I grew up here in Pensacola in Gulf Breeze, and nine months after I got married, my wife and I moved to Kansas City, Missouri. I mean, Missouri. We... <laughs> We, we lived there for three years. We, we had no family there. We had no close friends there. We, we were both students. 
There's no beaches there. There's no surf there. And there's this weird stuff that falls from the sky. It's, it's, it's called snow. And it's super cold there, ice. And, and I remember when we, we finally moved back to Gulf Breeze, I remember uh, driving back. I had a U-Haul truck, and, 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 and I finally got to the Bay Bridge. And I was seeing the water and the sunset, all the familiar sights. And, and inside, I, as soon as I saw that water, I said to myself, I'm home. I'm home. And there's just something about coming home. Je Jesus comes home. He's now a known teacher. He's a miracle worker. He's a rabbi with 12 disciples. I mean, he, he has astonished people with his teachings. He's healed. I mean, come on, he's raised the dead. And now he's coming home. And, and here's the deal. They, 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 they have these questions. Where did this man get these things? Where's this wisdom which is given to him? That such mighty works are performed by his hand. Is not this the carpenter, the, the son of Mary? There, there, there's some prejudice and some preconceived ideas. And so these rhetorical questions come forth in, in verse 3. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? Now, to be called a carpenter in Jesus' day didn't necessarily mean a skilled craftsman with great pay and high position. There's also another caveat to this word that also, and it's likely the meaning that was given here, is, is used for a handyman who went from house to house, doing small, odd jobs for a pittance of pay. And, and I believe that's the word that's used here. Is this not the carpenter? And on the scale of honor, well, and respect, it's just above the vi village idiot. So this is a, this is a put down for Jesus. Their preconceived opinion of Jesus produced a gap in their thinking about him that was quickly filled with unbelief. The second question is, isn't this Mary's kid? See, see, never in that day, even if the father was deceased, would you address a child by the mother's name. It wasn't the custom to describe a son by his mother, even if the dead had passed. But this is how Jesus was defined. It was rumored during his lifetime in Nazareth that Jesus was an illegitimate child, born out of wedlock, not Joseph's son, but that Mary had become pregnant before they got married. So, so here's the warm welcome. Is this not the carpenter? Is this not the illegitimate son of Mary? His brothers and sisters are mentioned, and, and what is inferred is, is they're certainly nothing special in talent. We've known them all their life. They don't have much gifting. How can their so-called brother really be any different? And, and look what it says in verse 3 there of chapter 6. They were offended at him. They're offended at Jesus. And the word means stumbled. Stumbled. Actually, the Greek word is, is, is from the word from which we get our word, scandal. It, it repelled them. It stumbled them. It, it was a, a sense of refuting and abandoning this, this understanding of who Jesus thought he was. In some sense, if you know the story of Jesus, from the very beginning of his life, Jesus was, in a sense, rejected. Oh, there, there, there's no room for you, Mary and Joe. Uh, you'll have to find somewhere else to have your child. And so most likely they did it in one of the caves where the young sheep were born outside of Bethlehem. By the time he was two, Herod was trying to assassinate him and all the other children there in Bethlehem. Reminds me of the story of, of Joseph. I, I, I'm sure you're familiar with Joseph, who was a young man, and God gave him this amazing dream. 
Remember Joseph, and he, 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 he was, had this amazing dream how he'd see his brothers bowing down to him and then his parents bowing down to him, and, and he was telling his brothers about it. And, and one day in, in Genesis chapter 37, he goes out because his father asked him to to check on the boys, and that they, they said to one another as he was coming, hey, look, the dreamer is coming. This guy who thinks he's somebody has these weird dreams. Let's kill him. And let's cast him in, in a pit. And we'll say a wild beast devoured him. We, we'll, we'll see what will become of this, of his great dreams. But Reuben heard it and he delivered him out of their hands. So, well, let's, let's don't kill him. Slow down. Let's don't shed blood. Let's, let's cast him in the pit, which is in the wilderness, and don't lay a hand on him that he might deliver him out of the hands and bring him back to the father. So it came to pass when Joseph had come, they stripped Joseph of his tunic, that coat of many colors that was on him. They took him and they cast him in a pit and the pit was empty and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal and they lifted up their eyes. And there was a company of Ishmaelites coming with, from Gilead with their camels, with spices and all this. And, and they were going to Egypt. So they said, Judah to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother? Let's sell him. And let us, our hands be upon him, for he's our brother and our flesh and his brothers. Listen, and the Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit. What do you think Joseph was saying at that time? As they're dragging him out of the pit, and there's a bunch of slave traders there hanging there. You think he's saying, boy, this is fun, guys. And they sold him for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Rejected by his own family. Jesus, beaten, rejected, sold by Judas for 20 silver coins. And our story, his hometown his friends, his, even his brothers and sisters at this time. Rejection. You read it all through the Gospels. The Pharisees and the Sadducees had religious reasons for rejecting Jesus. Oh, he blasphemes. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. He hangs out with, with sinners and, and tax collectors. In our Gospel here, Mark, he had just recently cast all these demons out of a man and, and they went into a herd of swine and those people who owned those swine, those business people, well, they had business reasons to reject Jesus. We want you to leave our town. Later we'll see Pilate and Herod reject Jesus because of political reasons. And, and let me have your attention. People have all kinds of reasons to reject Jesus. Even though he, he's proved himself, even though he, he, has, he has come on the scene and done so many miraculous, amazing things, oh, he's a blasphemer. Oh, oh we don't want you around Gadara. Uh, we've got political uh, positions to keep. Or some people just out of indifference or procrastination, even though Jesus has made it so clear and so amazingly true that he is the Son of God, people still reject Jesus. Listen, I just want to read a, a passage of Scripture from the Gospel of John. It's, it's an interesting passage, John chapter 1, where, where Jesus is, is rejected, or at least it speaks of his rejection. John chapter 1, it says, and he was in the world, speaking of Jesus, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, the power to become children of God to those who believe in his name. He came into this world, and the people rejected him. But there were some who received him. In Matthew, Jesus put it this way himself, his own words. He says, you're either for me or you're against me. That's what he said. You ever been rejected by a friend, 
or, or a family? You ever, ever been rejected by a group of people or, or maybe at a job or, or at a situation where, where, where uh, maybe even a parent rejected you? This is the climate and this is the, the situation of Jesus who, who's proved himself beyond a shadow of doubt who he is. I mean, anyone else around that area raised anyone from the dead? I don't think so. And he comes home. Oh, he's, he, he's, he, he's, he's a little bit above the village idiot. He, 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 he's an illegitimate child. We've got his whole family here. There's nothing special about them. Jesus says, you're either for me or you're against me. See, there, there's no such thing in the scripture where, where you can say, well, I'm sort of for Jesus. What? Yeah, I'm kind of a Christian. You are? Yes, uh, sometimes. How does that work? That'd be like saying to my wife, I sort of want to be your husband. <laughs> On the weekends. I, I sort of want to be married. I, I don't really want all the, you know, the, the confines or the, the obligations or the, the things that come with it. But, but I, I like to kind of hang out with you. I don't think that relationship would last very long, knowing my wife. Jesus comes on the scene, and from the very beginning, he says, okay, the kingdom of God is now. It's at hand. Repent. Leave the old life. Believe in me. And he begins calling people to himself. See, salvation, believing, and repentance is not a sort of a thing. Well, I kind of did it. No, it's a real full commitment. These guys threw down their nets and said, okay, we're all in. It's, it's like a marriage. You identify with him. You're, you're loyal to him. You, you follow him. Jesus' response to rejection, he, he, he responds with a, with a, with a proverb that, that they would have been somewhat familiar with, but he, he changes it a little bit there in, in chapter 6. He says, but Jesus said to them in verse 4, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own home. Now, now let me have your attention. Here's the deal. The problem was not with Jesus. It wasn't with his character. It wasn't with his ministry. It wasn't with his teaching. The problem was not with his miracles. The problem was with the people. Oh, they thought they knew all about Jesus. They had seen him as a boy, as a teenager. They, they had had him in their, their, their town for almost 30 years. They had grown so comfortable with him that they just couldn't believe he was who he's claiming to be. It's like the tourist who visited a famous art studio in France and went from room to room, saw the Mona Lisa. Saw the, the beautiful painting of Mary and Jesus with, with Jesus playing with a little lamb there in the Louvre. They saw, saw John the Baptist, the wedding feast at Cana. And, and he kind of rushed through, and, and on his way out, he said to one of the attendants, this tourist did, I, I really didn't see anything that special. And the attendant replied, it's not the pictures that are on trial here, sir. It's the visitors. And that's the same with Jesus. It's not Jesus who's on trial. <laughs> It's you and I. It's the hometown people who are on trial because Jesus has, has already proven who he is. Verse 5 says something pretty interesting. It says, now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few people and healed them. Now, I, I want you to understand this. It's not that Jesus didn't have the power to heal. We've already seen that. I mean, he could step into a hurricane and say, peace be still. He just raised someone from the dead there in chapter 5. Jesus decided, based on the context, I believe, of, of the rejection and the unbelief, that he would never force himself on people by creating miracles 
Oh, okay, you don't believe in me? Well, watch this. No, he wanted nothing to do with pushing himself. Jesus would, would respond to people's heartfelt need and desire. Those who seek his help, those who believe in him, those who want him, those people he would always heal and restore. I mean, he, some lady makes her way through a crowd and just touches his robe. Who, who, who touched me? Someone who has a need, someone who desires you to touch them. Look, look at verse 6. He himself was, uh, uh, only a couple of times in all of Scripture do you hear these words about Jesus. That he's astonished. And here in verse 6, he marveled because of their unbelief. I think the only other place in the New Testament where it says Jesus was astonished or marveled was when the centurion said, oh, you don't have to come to my house. I, I know what it's like to be over. People just say the word. I know the, the, the person will be healed. And Jesus was astonished at that person's faith. Well, here he's astonished at their unbelief. It's interesting. Verse Six, it tells us, he marveled. Then he went about the villages and the circuit teaching. Jesus sees that in spite of all his teaching and miracles and fame, the unbelief and the rejection are real and they're growing. So now he decides something amazing. He calls the 12, verse 7, to himself, two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, and whatever place you enter a house, stay there until you depart. And whoever will not receive you or hear you. Sound familiar? Just happened to Jesus. He says, and whatever place you enter a house, to stay till you depart. And whoever will not receive you or hear you when you depart, well, shake the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So they went out and preached that people should repent, the same message that Jesus had brought. And they cast out demons. And then there's something interesting here. They anointed with oil. First time that's, that's been done. Many who were sick and healed them. Jesus is now going to find out, he's now going to see what every leader needs to see and has to see. Can his vision be embraced by others? Will you guys step up to the plate? Can his authority be embraced and given to his disciples? Will they take it on? Can they take what they have been taught and can they teach other people the same thing? Jesus reached a place now in his ministry where, where he's, he's empowering and he's sending out. Can the results in ministry, his results, become their results? He, he had told them all the way back in chapter 1, I will make you fishers of men. And right now here in chapter 6, you know what he's saying? Time to fish or cut bait. It's time to fish, boys. You've watched, you've trained, you've, you've been with me now, time to fish. You ever heard the Lord say that to you? Hey, you've sat in church now, you've been disciple. you know the Bible, you've been coming for most of your life. Hey, it's time to fish. I remember when I went off to seminary, and the first couple years was all teaching and classes, and the third year... They kind of said to us, okay, time to fish. And they put me in a hospital for the summer every night as a chaplain with a, with a beeper on. And I went to all the different floors, cancer floor, maternity ward, children's ward, ministering to, to children, to adults, and all kinds of different scenarios. I'll never forget one night being up all night with a, with a young man whose uncle had stabbed him, and he, he eventually died. 
And every morning after, after my time at the hospital, we would meet in a conference room with some of the chaplains and my overseer, and they would ask me the question, so what'd you do last night? And I would tell my story, and they would pick apart how I responded to things. Sometimes there was great response. Sometimes they would go, you did what? <laughs> you stayed how long? Did they ask you to stay that long? Oh, I just didn't know how to get out of there. Or, or then there came the time when you had to speak a sermon before the, your class of peers, and they had it on a camera, and the professor was standing in the back like this. And you're like, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. <laughs> and then they would critique the message afterwards. And I'll never forget, there was this one guy, every time he would make a point, he would go up on his toes like this. And when they critiqued it, they had it on the screen afterwards, and the professor would go, okay, let's watch this. And every time he'd go up on his toes, the professor would go, bing, bing. <laughs> I felt so bad for that guy. <laughs> and then they had us do a funeral. Well, they didn't kill somebody or anything like that, but <laughs> they, they actually, we brought a coffin into the room, and somehow I got chosen to do the funeral. And so we're all there, a bunch of us, and, you know, the, everybody's supposed to be crying. And we're, you know, I get up and do this funeral. And basically the seminary said to us after two and a half years, okay, guys, time to fish. Time to take what you've been taught, and let's see if it works in practical scenarios in the hospital. Let's see if it's working in the churches that you're serving in. Let's, let's see if you can actually do any of this stuff that you're being taught. And Jesus sends his men out. And, and there comes a time in the Christian's life where, and it's not all head knowledge, it's like, okay, now I need to step into this and put my life into it. It's a call to that. I will make you fishers of men. So he says he divides them in the teams of two, which is interesting to me that, that he does this. Having just experienced this personal rejection of his own, I'm thinking Jesus is going to know, hey, you know, they're going to need each other. I'm going to send them out by themselves. When they're ridiculed, when they're turned away, they're going to need somebody's shoulder to cry on, to bounce something off. Did I, did I do that wrong? But also, they need the checks and balances. Everybody needs someone who can speak truth and love to them. Be because criticism, when people criticize you, can, can, can produce paranoia or the temptation to pull back and think, well, maybe I shouldn't do this. And so we send them out in teams. On the opposite end, success can lead to pride and big-headedness and you know, we need sometimes some people say, whoa, don't forget who you are. You're not Jesus. Everyone needs a loving critic and a listening confidant, an honest, loving person to, to bounce things off. And also, as Scripture would say in the Old Testament, that, that their testimony of Jesus needs to be established by two witnesses. And so Jesus sends them out two by two. And he gives them authority to cast out demons. I, I don't know how he did that. Was there a process? He sent them out in his name. And because he knows our ultimate battle is not flesh and blood, but spiritual wickedness in high places. They need authority and the power of Christ to cast out demons. They're not going in their own authority, but in his authority. To trust him and to simply follow him. And he tells them, look, these are the guidelines. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. Not a staff of people walking staff. No bag, which, which would have been a, many, some many believe a beggar's bag because a lot of these itinerant preachers in that day, and there were those who would take a bag and would beg and, and, and people would give. No bread, no copper in their money belts. 
the copper and the money belts is like small change that they would carry. Don't take that. I, I, I'm sending you off in, with, with, with a minimal amount of things, some sandals, a tunic, not a lot of preparation. There, there, there seems to be a sense of urgency here. And maybe the question is this, that we ask ourselves sometimes, what do I really need to be effective for Christ and at the same time remain dependent on him? Because sometimes when we have so much, we forget that we have to depend on him. And that's in a lot of different areas of life, not just ministry. And he tells him in verse 10, he says, and whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart that place. In other words, don't, don't try and find the writs. Don't say, well, you know, these people, they kind of like, they've got a much, they've got a five-star deal. This is only a two-star. Don't try to find the best lodging. You're there to serve. You're not a pampered guest. And, and I think that's something to remember. And so, so Jesus is, is giving some great, uh, imparting some great wisdom to that. And, and whatever, whoever will not receive you, nor hear you, here's what he says. When you depart, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. And then he says this. I say to you, it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city. He gives a declaration, and I want you to hear this is Jesus' words of the fact that they, those who have no belief, those who turn them away or ridicule them or as what just happened to Jesus and, and Nazareth reject him, that not only does the message of Jesus bring salvation, but the message of Jesus, well, it also brings judgment for those who refuse it. This always happens when Christ comes knocking. There are some who say no. There are some who reject, who won't open the door. They were going and sharing and, and healing and casting out demons, and then they were, they were telling people the good news. And I would say this, you know, that, that here at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus and then on into the book of Acts where the church was birthed, it's always been the mission of the church to go. The church is not a religious club. It's not a place where you come and find your chair and, and there's programs for all ages and make everyone happy. Nothing wrong with programs for everyone and nothing wrong with being happy. But I don't think we should ever forget that we've, we've been called to fish and to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Listen, let's never forget that. Amen. Let's never become so comfortable or, or, or entertain that, that we forget that we have a message of hope and forgiveness and grace for the world. That it's not just all about us. Jesus says to these men, as they've followed Jesus faithfully now for quite a while, he says, okay, uh, Let's go fishing. Let's see if you really will apply what you said you came to follow me for, to be my disciples. So they went out, verse 12. And they preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons. They anointed with oil many who were sick, and they healed them. Same message that Jesus gave. A message of repentance and belief, of casting out demons and healing the sick, because here's the deal. The kingdom of God is at hand, and it's still at hand. And, and as believers, that's our call. And, and as a non-believer or, or someone who has not fully surrendered to Christ, he's calling. He's knocking. And here's the apparent uh, understanding, I think, of this passage in this context, is that you either reject him or you receive him. And Jesus makes that pretty clear. And he says, then those who reject, well, there'll be a time of judgment. And he says, it's going to be a tough day for them. You know, I was, I was listening to my, I got a phone call Yesterday, from my 
friend, Pastor Fidel, down in Fort Lauderdale. He's a longtime friend. He says, oh, I'm, I'm, I want you to see this little video. I'm going to send it to you. I go, okay. He says, this is kind of funny. I said, okay. So it's about the thief on the cross, the one that gets to go to heaven. You guys know that story, right? Still awake, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so the thief on the cross gets to heaven. He's met by an angel. This is Fidel's story, not mine. And, 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 <laughs> and so an angel meets him there and goes, hey, how'd you get here? He goes, what do you mean? He goes, how'd you get to heaven? He goes, I, I don't know. I was, I was being executed. There was me and a friend, and we were kind of cursing this guy in the middle at first, and then I realized he was innocent. And I said to my friend, well, what are you doing? Stop. This guy's done nothing wrong. And so, so, so I looked at him and said, remember me. And the guy says, today you'll be with me. And so the angel says, no, no, no. How did you get here? He goes, the guy in the middle. He said, I could come. The guy on the cross in the middle said, I could come. He goes, Just wait right here. Let me go get my supervisor. <laughs> so, so he brings another angel in. And he asks him, he says, so he's very pointedly, he says, do you believe in justification by faith? And the guy goes, what? He goes, do you believe in justification by faith? He says, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, okay, do you understand and trust the inerrancy of Scripture? He goes, what? He goes, how did you get here? He goes, I told the other guy, the guy on the middle cross said I could come. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Because that's how I'm here. And I would submit to you that that's how everybody gets to heaven. The guy on the cross says we can come. Yes. Right? right? And if you never trusted him for what he did for you on the cross, then you can't come. That's what Jesus says. That's not my words. He says, whosoever believes in me will not perish, but of everlasting life. So one day you have to answer the question, if you haven't already, of who Jesus is and what he did on the cross for you. And I would say this to you, he, he came, and he's not the one on trial. It's you and I. It's what we do with him. And the people of Nazareth said, he's an illegitimate village idiot. We got his brothers and sisters here. They rejected him, and Jesus left. As far as I know, I don't think he ever went back home. I don't think he ever did. He tried it twice. And, 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 and I think about the times that Jesus comes to, to your home, to my home, our heart, so to speak, and he knocks once, he knocks twice. I think he knocked on mine more than once or twice. I rejected him a couple of times. But I'm so grateful that he decided. I didn't call him a village idiot. I, I, I didn't go that far. But I, but I didn't believe in him at first. But here's the wonderful thing about Jesus. He's the God of the second chance, third chance, fourth chance, fifth chance. <laughs> For all of us who have no chance. Yes. And that's why we love him.